Good afternoon. Let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to join this distinguished panel. Also, a word of appreciation to the Center for Financial Stability and Deutsche Bank for uh, me being part of this year's jury of the Deutsche Bank Prize awarded to Professor Robert Schiller. Um, it was a truly enriching experience to serve on the jury and to discuss with my distinguished colleagues the state of monetary and financial economics and its analytical and empirical contributions to uh, understand the development of the financial crisis and its still evolving implications for the future conduct of monetary policy and financial as well as macroprudential regulation. Against the latter background, uh, we were in absolute agreement that there is no better recipient of the 2009 Deutsche Bank Prize in Financial Economics than Professor Schiller. Drawing from my experience at the OECD and previous work at the World Bank, I will briefly reflect on the role of international organizations in dealing with crisis and with governments uh, during times of crisis. In doing so, I will uh, address three uh, brief uh, issues on the accomplishment and the failures of international organizations to anticipate and deal with the uh, crisis. Let me start with an analytical work, empirical assessment, and projections carried out by international organizations. International organizations have a long tradition in carrying out analytical work that relates to their core institutional mission and objectives. In addition, they bridge a gap between uh, the real world and academia in areas of their specialization. Historical examples abound uh, regarding um, successful areas of analytical research and publications and um, advancing the frontier of our understanding in many different areas. I drew up a list, but because of time constraints, I will, I will skip that to refer now to the second area of demonstrated comparative advantage of organizations uh, in the production, in this case, and dissemination of rich and specialized international data sets. We use them all the, all the time, being inside or outside those organizations. The combination of internal analytical expertise and putting together systematic panel data sets has taken organizations to develop a strong comparative advantage in conducting cross-country and panel data empirical research, as well as in-depth country studies that tend to be consistent across countries and make also use of cross-country data sets. Much of the cross-country research is policy-oriented and provides benchmarking of policy inputs and results to individual countries. Examples of international research includes background empirical work carried out in preparation of the organization's flagship reports, such as the IMF's WIO and GFS reports, the World Bank's World Development Report, the BIS Annual Report, the OECD's Economic Outlook, and Going for Growth reports. By and large, the latter regular flagship reports define, actually, in my views, the frontier of policy-relevant international analysis and projections, standing on sound, generally sound analytical footing and using up-to-date information. This leads me to the uh, immediate question about the quality of their projections. I am not aware of any systematic recent assessment of out-of-sample forecast errors in the projections of international organizations in comparison to those produced by the markets, by analysts, and governments. In the absence of such comparison, I can only venture the following. It is unlikely, in my view, that international organizations have incurred in smaller forecast errors than the private sector or governments. From my experience at the OECD, it seems unlikely that we did a significantly better job than the miserable performance of forecasters worldwide in anticipating the downturn and, once it started, in forecasting its depth or the shape of the now beginning recovery. But on the positive side, international organizations have a comparative advantage in generating projections based on the fact that their human and modeling resources for carrying out double-checking and imposing international consistency of country and world market projections is an order of magnitude larger than those available in private or government institutions. A final negative note on the analytics, empirics, data gathering, country analysis projections carried out by international organizations. There's a lot of duplication and overlap among international organizations in the coverage of cross-country and country intelligence, research, policy analysis, and recommendations. 
And uh, this certainly reflects waste and inefficiency, and this also implies a significant challenge for the international community to, to get it better. Now let me turn to the second issue of crisis prevention. Um, as a result of the Asian LTCM, Russian sort of triple sequential crisis of 97 to 98, 10 years ago, significant efforts were devoted in international organizations to develop early warning systems or models to detect, to detect macro financial crises before they should happen. These efforts were largely spearheaded by the IMF, where people like Lisondo, Reinhardt, and many others developed uh, significant models. The verdict, however, on the predictive power of these tools was rather negative. They were simply not able in anticipating future crises in an effective way out of sample based on the early development of macro or financial aggregate. And hence, they were largely discarded from the toolkits of international organizations when this crisis hit. Now let me turn to financial markets. Like private analysts and individual governments, international organizations were fooled by the great moderation on the macro conditions that fed the big boom. International organizations were similarly clueless on the market failures and policy and regulatory failures that interacted with excessively expansionary macro policies in generating this unprecedented financial crisis, cum great recession. Like private analysts and governments, organizations were fund fundamentally blind and ignorant on the huge risk taking that means the massive global search for risk that fed on extreme leveraging and perverse financial innovation. Like the markets and individual governments, international organizations did not take seriously enough Professor Schiller's analytical work, uh, his uh, assessments on U.S. housing prices together with Professor Case, his prescient warnings, and his empirical work. While this is generally true, there are a few issues on which individual IOs got it right, pointing to specific areas of concern for macroeconomic and financial stability, but without getting the whole picture right, obviously. An early example of large policy concern was the build-up of global imbalances, quote-unquote, in the world economy, which actually I think is a terrible misnomer for the fact that the large supply of Asian excess saving, excess but not excessive saving in a normative way, financed excess and excessive this saving in the U.S. and a few other industrial economies, reflecting in large, excessive, that is unsustainable current account deficits. Both international organizations and several U.S. academics warned against these developments, nurtured, which were nurtured by strongly perverse pro-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies, particularly in the U.S. Another example of correct finger pointing is that for years before 2008, and I'm sure Niels uh, Tigerson is a uh, could attest to that, the OECD was very critical of the role of the two government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, in subsidizing housing investment in the U.S., pointing toward the danger of feeding the housing bubble and endangering financial markets. Not surprisingly, this policy assessment fell on deaf ears in Washington. Another example is uh, something which uh, goes back in history a bit, which is the World Bank and the IMF teaming up together in the 1990s to develop financial sector assessment, or FSAPs, for both industrial and developing countries. They have been carried out for 10, 15 years, I think closer to 10, for many countries, and by and large, they have contributed to strengthening financial and capital market development and their adequate regulation supervision. Obviously, without the benefit of the lessons we're draw drawing now and after the current crisis. And in this context, we should also mention that carrying out an FSAP for the U.S. was adamantly refused by the U.S. government. My final issue or topic has to, de to do with dealing with the crisis and its aftermath. The crisis certainly hit the world like a nuclear bomb one year and three weeks ago um, after the fall of Lehman's. By and large, I think that international organizations reacted well to the crisis by doing four or five things. One is to put in place crisis teams within the organizations to understand what was going on regarding market developments in individual countries and assembling consistent cross-country information on financial market developments and emergency responses by the individual governments and central banks.
Second, by organizing in a well-structured way discussions and meetings with government officials for comparing alternative emergency policy options. Third, by conducting early cross-country assessment and empirical studies of the needs and likely effects of emergency policies in financial markets and to monitor in fiscal policy. Uh, early examples of this are the OECDs and the IMFs measurements and uh, simulations of the likely impact, impact of the discretionary fiscal packages to get put together by industrial and in the case of the IMF also uh, developing economies. Um, a fourth dimension was that beyond the cross-country analysis and policy recommendations, uh, providing in-depth assessment and policy advice to individual countries affected by the crisis was taken very much up by international organizations. In this regard, the role of the international